Uh, I'm David Tuckett and I'm going to talk about another project. This is a project that was funded by um, uh, rebuilding macroeconomics so I'll say something about it. So the background is that the general aim of uh, rebuilding to explore the potential of new empirically based theory relevant to policy making. And the question, can cross-disciplinary theories based on understanding how human actors actually take economic decisions and respond to each other, can that give additional evidence? And I want to stress throughout this talk, I'm not talking about a competition to wipe out existing approaches. It's, can it provide additional evidence and what would the use of that be? <clears throat> now, in particular, this would be evidence based on observation of the way humans in the economy proceed. And I'm going to, for the sake of this talk, talk about it as walking about economics. I actually got this because Douglas sent me uh, or alerted me to Danny Blanchfile's book published this year where he makes the case for walking about economics. Of course, it's what uh, many social scientists have been doing for years, especially anthropologists do ethnography, etc. Interestingly enough, Thomas Bewley from Yale did a very interesting exercise back in 1999, talking to business people to discover about how firms behave with wages in a recession. Uh, I did stuff talking to fund managers, and of course Douglas Holmes, who's a co-author on this, along with uh, Laura and uh, Alice, talked to central bankers uh, 10 years ago. Now we have some theoretical orientations to all this. We really want to move beyond abstract and computational models. And the central idea behind the whole thing is that information has not been properly examined up to now in economics. It's just assumed, oversimplifying, you either have it or you don't, or you have it before somebody or after somebody. It's rough. But what it actually is, is one of the things that interests uh, us, <clears throat> particularly because you're also interested in what I call radical uncertainty, which it means that if you're not sure at the point you take a decision how it's going to play out, you don't know what's going on in the world, then actually what agents usually have to do is to make sense of conflicting signals about what's happened. So we have a kind of hermeneutic perspective, you could say, where things like, uh, where there's a theory of knowledge creation, where things like narratives, beliefs, emotion, are mechanisms for constructing meaning in the world. And I'd love to say more about that, but I can't really. And all of this is socially mediated. And it goes beyond behavioral models. So I think economists have, have got themselves into a slight difficulty by assuming the real behavior is the behavior in the models. Yeah. And behave, the behavior that you actually observe is some sort of problem. And in fact, Deirdre <laughs> talked quite well about that, because it's not only economists who've done that. But for example, Schiller, who has, I think, moved things forward by thinking about narratives, he's still got narratives essentially within the framework of the irrational. <laughs> Similarly, uh, Genaioli and Schlieffer, who I think have written a very, very good book about the role of beliefs, Again, they've actually now moved to the fact that economists should look at the biology of beliefs, which is missing out a few levels for me. But it is a very interesting approach. But again, they're basically wanting to understand behaviour that is not the sort of behaviour that we think should be in the markets. So to explore these ideas, we approach the chief economist of the Bank of England, Andy Haldane, and try to arrange to talk to people who actually we thought might know what's going on in the economy, what people are saying about it. That is the Bank of England's agent, agents, who are 12 regional agents who are in all parts of the country. What they actually do is they, they see 9,000 business contacts, not only business, also universities, schools, charities, and so on, but business contacts, 9,000 every year. And uh, in the, all the regions of the UK, which means that they see about 600 uh, businesses for each of the MPC meetings, and this information is available. And that's one of the things we've been looking at. 
But we've also been doing walkabout economics in the sense of been walking into the Bank of England and I've interviewed so far um, six of the nine MPC members who've talked to me about what they're actually doing. Uh, and of course we talk to the agents themselves as well as sit in on the agents contact meeting. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we get, we get from all that. Now, I've put up on the board the, um, uh, what do I call it, the disclaimer, because we're in very tricky territory here, and uh, Dorian has <laughs> said something about it, but actually uh, the, the GDPR regulation has really messed up this project, because the bank, or the bank's lawyers, had to really consider whether the data they collected from all these businesses over the years, which could be a fantastic data set, actually was safe to, to look at. So we have a compromise in which we, we are allowed to look at the agent's reports on the, uh, the contact visits that we attended, which may seem a bit odd, but actually it's interesting to see what the agents made and wrote down and put into the system and what, what we also heard. And actually we found so far that the agent, what the agent wrote down was pretty much what we thought was the important thing, what was there. Okay, so going on now, what does an MPC member actually do? I want to say a little bit about this, even though you may all know, because this is what actually can not. It's very different being an MPC member than it is looking at the model. The MPC members have to decide with eight other people what's going on in the real economy. So they don't start with facts, not really. They start with information about what the ONS and other people have collected about the economy, which is always out of date. So there have been significant errors, if you want to call that, in monetary policy in the past, because actually the economy was in recession when they thought it was overheating and people, people put up interest rates. So these, these are things that necessarily happen. So one of the problems they have to, to address is what is actually happening in real time now. And in a way, this is an interesting test of economic models, because as you know, we're all supposed to have very accurate rational expectations in the models. Well, here they are actually having disagreements among themselves and trying to work out what is happening. Uh, they have something called the pre-MPC meeting, which is when about 100 people from the bank and all the bank staff are trying to work on different aspects of what's happening to the labour market, what's happening to foreign trade and so on, come together, and it's quite a show. And the MPC, they put up their, their graphs and show their models and put their predictions. And what very interesting then happens is this. The MPC members in each, I went to three meetings, they say, um, Phil, what do you think is going on here? What's the narrative here? Because, of course, the nice graph that is going off and then going dot, dot, dot beyond what you know is fine, but what is the causal mechanism that's generating this? And the MPC members who've been appointed, that is, particularly the external ones, because they have expertise outside in whatever it is they have expertise in, what they're interested in is seeing whether their personal intuitions about what they think is happening is happening. Right? And so you immediately have this whole issue about causality, and I'll be coming, coming, coming back to that. Um, so what they do is they have this pre-meeting which sets it off, and there's a lot of papers and stuff. Each of them has some research people to help them. They then discuss with the other eight over a series of uh, around eight days, uh, and finally have decision meetings, a kind of two decision meetings, or two aspects of decision meeting. One to actually decide, uh, is the economy on target for the particular mandate they have, or do they think they need to do something, in which case what? And then they also have to, and this is a very serious part of the meeting, do a line-by-line, -line or word-by-word, -word agreement of the minutes because the minutes become a public document. And you also, it's very important that each individual member is personally responsible to Parliament for their, their voting and their view. So they have to go along occasionally and explain what they've done. And um, um, some people who, 
who have uh, been on the MPC uh, previously told me that that made a big difference to, to, to you. you. You felt it was a very serious matter. Okay. Now, there are a lot of current challenges in central banking, which, because I haven't got time, I won't really go over. But if you just look at today's announcement of uh, they've had a press conference today, Carney and announced the interest rates remain changed, or if you look at what the Fed has just announced, you'll find there are numerous, numerous issues about what's happening to productivity, is there underemployment, is there employment, uh, uh, is, is, is there, are there long-term structural changes, what is happening, etc, etc. So all of these things are coming into the discussion. And one of the key points I'd like to make is that really the interesting thing about central bank practice for macroeconomics is that it involves, in Lenny Smith and um, Erica Thompson's terms, moving out of model lab. It's what, in fact, uh, Bind Blinder and Reese call workaday monetary policy. It's highly situational, remarkably flexible, and adaptable to changing circumstances with the central bank constantly in learning mode, trying to puzzle out what is going on in an uncertain world. This was written in 2005. Mm -hmm. Or Jay Powell, the current Fed chair, wrote the following about the Taylor Rule, which is at the heart of this matter. If inflation is higher than pi squared, sorry, pi star, Raise the real federal runs rate relative to R star, R star. Navigating by the stars can sound straightforward. <laughs> Guiding policy by the stars in practice, however, has been quite challenging of late because our best assessments of the location of the stars have been changing significantly. <laughs> okay. How can the agency help? Well, the first thing that they can do is make up for missing data by the fact that they can try to give real-time information about what's actually happening. And there is evidence from uh, published studies by the bank that the scores they make, they, they make scores of is this business better, you know, change on the year before, these scores actually are, uh, are very predictive of ONS data and they're particularly pre predictive of the ONS data when it's finally revised. So it does appear, although it's quite hard to say why, which I don't have time to go into, but the agents' visits and the scores they make actually do fill an information gap to a very considerable extent. The second thing they traditionally do is that they represent the bank to business and the public. And this is a very important part of their job, and it's one of their original uh, functions. And it's particularly important nowadays because they have these network events, they have an MPC member or coming, coming down, they have the forward guidance, which is all about giving information to people, and they're currently engaged in, a, in an activity of forming citizens' panels, which is actually to try and get information, not just from businesses and so on, but also citizens. And I should have said that some of the things uh, that, you know, no, I, mean, I don't think. So, and also an important thing that the agents do is that they help to justify the bank being in touch for the purpose of speeches and public settings. If you look at Mark Carney's reference to the agents over the last few years, he typically uses it when he goes to the Treasury Committee and places like that to say, our agents tell us. Now, one reason for this is if you, if you go to the Treasury Committee and say, our models tell us, people tend to laugh at them, and they say, what about 2008? So the agents are a very good cover, and this is one of the things that, that I think is, is true, and, and it's, um, it, it's, it's an interesting point. But the main thing that we think the agents help with is what I've already talked about, that is causality. Because what they're really doing is providing the MPC with forward-looking information to help them assess economic and financial conditions across the, the UK. And there is evidence of this. So, for example, during the financial crisis, they were able to see things happening in the economy that were not known by any other way. 
David Miles, for example, has talked to us about several instances when he was on the NPC. They, for example, spotted the role of migrant workers in the British economy before anyone had thought about it, pretty much. Uh, and they also uh, were able to give very good information about post-crisis identification of credit problems for SMEs when the banks were doing that. And these, these are, they're also asked to investigate puzzles. And of course, at the moment, we have to investigate Brexit. Now, what we want to argue is that the particular added value of the agents' meetings comes from what we'll call the art of conversation. That is that formally, the meetings with contacts are set up to get annual data on pricing, employment, wages, etc. You know, what have you been giving your workers, etc. <clears throat> That's a formal setting to create these scores I've mentioned. But more informally, if you go there and attend, you get this walkabout economics. Because uniquely, they are talking to senior business people, very senior, often at the top of the firm, in an atmosphere of personal trust, creating a conversation in which their on-the-ground intellectual acumen gives insights into motives, plans, feelings, changes, adjustments and observations which evoke the agent's intuition. As the agent's going along and he's, he or she is seeing these things and adjusting to it. So we think that therefore what they give the possibility to is to access what Deirdre would call the ideas in the economy. That is to say, they access and intuit stories about its dynamic evolution, the dynamic evolution of business plans evolving, and I'll try to give you some quick examples in a moment. In particular, one of the things we're interested in is often this comes in digressions, right? So, well, I'll come back to that in a minute. So let's hit, take one example, which I've had to, we've, we've had to make slightly gentle, but uh, take visits to large recruitment agencies, all right? So the contacts there describe what we would call an enormous epistemic network for information gathering. These people recruit worldwide for household name, all the big household name companies, for profit or not, across multiple sectors, and maintain relationship with those they, they place. And I didn't know this at all, maybe you all you knew it, but the modern employment agency <coughs> doesn't just you know, find workers for Nisa or whatever. It, it also in, keeps relationships with these people, and it engages in relationships with the people they place as well as with the employer. So they also know a lot about what people who are on the job market are thinking, looking to, motivated by, etc, etc. And they have a very large access to a candidate databases, you know, things like LinkedIn and those kind of things they have total access to. So the conversations with such contacts gives a picture of global employment trends including issues, for example, of cross-border recruitment and drawing on the work of thousands of their own employees, fine-grained assessments of the employment situation in different cities, qualifications that are in demand, where jobs are abundant, where they're not, where salaries and benefits are offered, how they're varying, etc. And via the network of recruiters, they give information on shifts in the values and expectations of workers. So they're getting both sides of the story, and really understanding something of the current labour market in really considerable detail. But also from their own businesses, that is from the person talking about not just all this information, but also their own businesses, you get ideas about the way the whole shape of work and employment and everything is changing. Don't think I've got time to go in, I've got, we'd have some quite nice examples, but you know, Things like the gig economy, but not that, but people know about that, but lots of the particular way in which people, many people now accept that it's going to be short-term contracts, it's not a job for life. And so the whole way in which people create a career path is kind of known with these agencies who help them, including with extra training or, or things like that. So it's, it's very different than anything I'd imagined anyway. And, and there are numerous contacts of this kind. I don't have time, but for example, uh, we, we visited an account, accountancy firms, for instance, 
that, that uh, or, or, or law, a legal firm that are dealing with um, bankruptcies, or not just bankruptcies, but what, you know, where people are having to reorganize the company legally, you get fantastic information from them across sectors of all the sorts of things that happen. Or you go to a construction company, and the construction company knows that you know, last year we were building warehouses, now we're building schools. Right? So they get an idea of what the, is actually going on in the economy like that. Okay, I, I think I've given you a little bit of a sense. I've got lots of examples here. Of it. So we think that the, the agents therefore have a particular data advantage, which is of great value. That is to say, this business about causality, and actually one of the agents, a particularly thoughtful one, insisted on this particular term. It, he feels that, that understanding causality is at the heart of what the meetings with contacts provide in a way that it simply isn't available to the NPC in any other way. Because in the meetings, contacts explain causality as they discuss their business plans and their um, decision making. So I can recall being in one meeting with a, um, a company creating capital goods and th there are many problems throughout the economy with, skill, with highly skilled workers. To, you, you, you sell these capital bits of capital equipment, but where you often make the money is on servicing. And you need skilled people to service them. And there was a, there's a shortage of, of skilled people. But these, this guy was describing in detail the way they try and get around that. And the main thing you get from these meetings is the extraordinary capacity of business people to adjust and adapt in a highly agile way to the actual conditions. So it, it's like the, you know, it's like the argument about innovation in, back in the 18th century, for that matter. You know, people, engineers fiddling with things and improving things, and then that becomes a new thing, etc. And this constant fiddling. Another example is in a situation of labour shortage. So one of the, one of the uh, companies was, was realised that, that, that there was a bunch of people they could perhaps try to attract, i.e. married women with children, so they start adjusting their practices to be convenient for and organising crashes and also. So they, they do another lot worried about migrant workers, as after Brexit, feeling nobody wanted them and so on, so they organised special things around to, to make people feel uh, more looked after, more valued, and so on and so forth. So it's, the, the point is that these may seem individual examples, but our argument is that they actually are potentially giving you exactly what you need, which is insight into what's changing in the economy. Because the real issue, what macroeconomics doesn't do very well, is pick up changes. And for that, as Don just said, you need data. And this is the sort of data that, that's available. Now, based on all this, we want to, um, uh, I, there's one other thing I want to mention, is there's some what we could call epistemic tension in, in this system of the monetary policy, all the monetary policy operation. Because there's a, there's a feeling on the part of, I think, many MPC members and officials and traditionally trained economists, including the agents, many of whom are traditionally, that, you know, what's the, day, what's the evidence? I can't just give one, you know, one example. And as a result, there's quite a bit of pressure on the agents to include formal surveys in these meetings. And what we've noted, and they've had to do this for Brexit, because they Brexit readiness, they've had to say, these surveys disturb the meeting, and there's a definite tension. You know, you've got a very high-level person, right? He's given a questionnaire that's been designed for every company in the UK. 50% of the questions are irrelevant. Uh, the good agents sort of finesse it. <laughs> the agents who are not so confident work through, and you can see the guy go to sleep. <laughs> so, and there's quite a bit of interest in survey. The bank is you know, it's now got a decision maker survey. I'm not saying these are useless, but I think the, they touch the gold that's coming from these agents at, at, at that period. This is one of the things we'll be discussing. So, lastly, I want to just quickly put forward and very quickly. 
what we're developing from this is what we would call a narrative hypothesis, very preliminary about monetary policy. And it, it's based on the idea that, uh, that stochastic models are not actually very useful if you've got a change in situation. I mean, they may be, you know, I'm not saying they shouldn't go on doing them, but we, we need something else. And we think that uh, walking about gives you some insight into these kind of dynamic social and psychological things and perhaps make it more comprehensible. Now, from this perspective, we think of, I, I mentioned that information is, is not given, it has to be constructed. So economic agents are constructing their information and then they're making decisions. Now in this sense, narratives matter, not because narratives are, so to speak, interesting stories that people get attached to, but because narratives are one of the central ways, Nick could elaborate better than me, but they are a central means in which human cognition actually works. There's quite a lot of argument going back to Bruner and so on, about the way the human development goes in order to be able to tell stories. You've got a young child, you'll know that's what happens, they tell you stories. Tell you. So, narratives in this perception are vital to the way you understand the world. They do automatically include usually causal information hidden within them, and they are extremely important. That's what, when the NPC people say, well, what's the story here, Bill? They want a narrative which is telling them, some, making some forward-looking prediction about what's happening. Now, in, in my particular theory, we have the theory of conviction narratives that I won't be able to elaborate now, but it takes advantage of the fact that narrative engages both the cognitive part of the brain and also the affective. So it's, it's both these things are happening. So it gives you a particular sense of accuracy that is what's important about it. What, what business people need to make their innovations is to develop a conviction narrative. A business plan requires and is based on a conviction narrative. <clears throat> when you're drawing up a conviction narrative, you're taking local contextual narratives, understanding ways of doing things, heuristics, etc., in your firm and your area. And you're also influenced by shared conviction narratives. So, you know, for many years, to take a simple one, uh, shareholder value. This is completely a narrative, which is now fading away. Right? Uh, but other kinds of narratives that might exist about the way you do things. Should you be near your supply, suppliers or farther away? It's a big issue that's been going on in business. I won't... Uh, that these, the, the, because it's the way narratives are shared, and that this fact that there's a shared narrative becomes, is, is a way of coordinating the economy along a particular narrative about what's happening. And it's particularly sensitive in the sense that, in our way of thinking about it, if someone believes something, that is, that, at least for those moments, that is the truth. That's how you base your action. Whether or not it's really the so if the narrative starts to become our economy is going down the tube, or this, then that will become infinite. So conviction narratives in that sense, shared conviction are what sociologists call social facts. They're real phenomena that influence. Now I'm going to stop in two minutes. So therefore, we have an idea, I'd love to have time to develop that really what the Monetary Policy Committee are doing is creating a shared narrative, a conviction narrative about coordination in the economy. We actually think this is what they are increasingly doing, even in half note. I don't think they fully know it, and I think if they did fully know it, there would be things that follow. But when I say that, I'm not talking about a fantasy. Right? I'm talking about the fact that it is hard work to develop a conviction narrative. If, if, if you're going to do it, you first need to do really good research, so to speak, via this walking about stuff of what is actually going on in the economy. You then bring that back, you then turn that into the narrative which you think is 
so to speak, true, and then you issue it forth. Okay? It won't be convincing if it's at odds with what these people who have been talking to you will tell. So, so it's not just any old narrative. It's not the Bank of England governor making it up and saying, oh, it's okay, everything's going to be all right, right? It actually has to be based on something. So we think there's quite a lot uh, to be gained by looking at monetary policy in these ways, because it does appear to me that if you make assumptions about uncertainty, then it, it isn't going to be automatic that an economy converges or, or coordinates, and that some role for creating uh, uh, coordination narratives is required. But I could make that argument a greater length, hopefully more convincingly. Thank you very much.